James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Two quick uh, housekeeping items uh, before we dive in and talk about uh, James this morning. First of all, I don't think I saw them here today, but an official welcome to uh, little Theo Piasecki, who was born Tuesday, right, Tuesday, uh, in the 5 pound, 11, 12 ounce range, 5, 12, yeah, well, what's our length, do we have a length? 18 and a half, there you go, you got some proud grandparents there. <laughs> Other grandparents are away today, but uh, yeah, welcome them. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing them and trust that the family uh, is doing well. A uh, second quick item of housekeeping. Uh, it, it just occurred to me as we're up here, you know, and I'm watching the, this mass of masculinity approach the stage here and, and pray for Steve and Vanna and then poor Trish. Uh, it's just flying solo as the female representative of our, de of our deacons. You know, it was, uh, it was about, I don't know, over a decade ago now that the Bible Fellowship Church, you know, felt convicted of the Lord that, you know, in Scripture we don't see any prohibition against, you know, women in the office of deacons. And, and so they, you know, said, yeah, yeah, this is often open to men and women. And then it was a few years later that, you know, each individual church had to, you know, uh, be convinced of that from Scripture as well. And our congregation uh, was led in that same, same, same vein. And so it opened up the, the position of deacon to, to women. And, um, yeah, you can see we're still, uh, we're, still, we're, still, uh, we're still operating at half strength, if you ask me, <laughs> in some ways. Or, or not that or Trish is carrying the full load of that either way. 
Uh, which is all to say that, you know, we've talked about this as elders. Maybe we're not being as explicitly clear about the process of how, you know, one either becomes an elder or deacon, and I'll let Mark go into that more, um, you know, some other Sunday. But other than just to say that I know we have some, some really gifted, spirit-filled, compassionate, merciful servants, uh, women in this church. And if it's, I, just, I just feel like I just want to say that if you ever feel like, man, I wonder if the Spirit in particular is equipping me to step into that more official role or office of a mercy worker or of a deacon, man, please come talk to any one of the elders or to myself. Um, we'd be happy to really talk and, and pray that with you. That's, that's how it worked with uh, Steve and Vanna. Both of them were, were sensing um, this, you know, call of the Lord. Steve and I started meeting together and praying, I don't know, well over a, a year or so ago. And just really, was that two years ago? Where's Steve? I don't even know. But we just started praying about that and really just trying to discern God's leading on that. Yeah, there he is. Was that two years ago? Has it been two years already? Anyway, well, that's, but that's how, that's how it goes. So, all to say, and I won't go much further, but if you're particularly a woman, not that, you know, our men are failing at their task or anything like that, but boy, if, you know, if you feel led of the Lord and you feel that and we'd just like to spend some time praying about that, come talk to us. Come talk to Trish. <laughs> She'll probably try to get you to sign on the dotted line, so just be careful about that. <laughs> all right, anyway. Um, I feel like there was another item in my housekeeping business. I don't know, but... Um, more, uh, James, um, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we've been kind of spending, uh, normally we work through a book of the Bible together, uh, um, but we kind of put John on hold, and through the Lent season, as we prepare for celebration of Easter and Friday, right, all of that, uh, we've been kind of taking a look at the, what has been known throughout the history of the church as the seven deadly sins, right? These sins that the church through the ages has particularly, is uniquely identified as just uniquely deadly uh, to our lives, to our relationship with God and with others and with his creation and all of that. And we're kind of just using these as a sort of a guide to, during this Lenten time, uh, let the Spirit of Christ go to work on us, reveal things that we need revealed, and also to cultivate all the more, just a deeper appreciation as our sin is revealed for what it is Christ accomplished at the cross and in the resurrection you know, and, and each week I, I kind of say a little bit about these seven deadly sins. And this morning, for whatever reason, like I just feel led to, to start off with the reminder that Jesus gives us in Matthew, where he says, man, and just those from very familiar lines, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am gentle and humble. Why am I blanking on that? <laughs> Humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right? And the thing is, I don't think Jesus is there saying, hey, come to me, you know, because at the end of the day, I don't have too much for you to do anyway. So you can just kind of, you essentially can live your life however you want to. I don't think that's what he's saying by saying my burden is light. I think he's saying that, look, you're either going to love and obey and will follow me as your king. Or you're going to love and obey and follow something else. Some other system, some other thing, some other desire. And at the end of the day, if it's not me, it can become so burdensome and so wearying and so oppressive and even so enslaving to you, right? So it's this wonderful invitation to break free of that and to come to him and find rest for your weary souls. One of the books that I'm reading on these seven deadly sins, uh, Rebecca De, uh, I forget her last name. It's one of those Dutch names that begins with D-E, De Young or something. I don't know. But uh, she wrote the book, and she entitled the book Glittering Vices. A look at the seven deadly sins. And part of the premise is, right, that, that yeah, these deadly sins, they have this glittering allure and appeal to them. And that's almost like they beckon that as you participate in this way of life. There is where you're going to find life and joy and blessing and happiness, right? But the church is saying, yeah, watch out for that. That is deadly stuff because it becomes oppressive. It becomes a burden. It becomes wearying, 
right? And which is to say that, that you know, again, my interest in, in walking through these seven deadly sins is not just to unearth one more thing that you need to feel horrible about and be fearful of the living God about. Maybe for some of you that is the case. That, but that's not my intention. My intention is, you know, through the wisdom of the church, is just to un- unearth these things and say, man, watch out. Because these are glittering, but they can be oppressive burdens. They can be enslaving yokes. And the invitation is always to come to Christ. And I think maybe our, our sin this morning is a classic example of that. Uh, anger, rage. Wrath. <laughs> right, that's the one we're talking about this morning. And maybe we'll get it out this way. Uh, let's, do a, let's do a quick poll here with a show of hands. True or false? Our society as a whole is more angry now than they were a generation ago. Raise your hand if you think that's true. Raise your hand if you say that's false. All right. Actually, that's... Well, that's kind of close to the national statistics. Eighty-four some percent of people think that we are more angry now than we were a generation ago. And they give a whole host of reasons for that or whatever. I won't ask this second question. You can think about it. Well, I will ask it, but I won't ask for a show of hands. You can think about it. I wonder to the church, true or false, anger, not as deadly Not as big a problem as, I don't know what, sexual sin, gender dysphoria, transgenderism, drug abuse, abuse of power, whatever. True or false? Uh, I wonder, if we ask that of of the church by and large, it certainly seems sometimes that we would answer true to that. No, 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 not as deadly. I mean, we've talked about that. Part of the reason is because we're always inclined to see the more deadly stuff as the stuff that the, my neighbor out there is carrying or living in. Right? We don't tend to think that the deadly stuff is the stuff that resides in here day in and day out, and I have to wage war with by the Spirit's help. But when you put those two you know, questions together, that we're more angry, and probably we tend to think that's not as deadly as some of this other stuff that's out there, it almost presents this thing that we, that we think of anger as just an unfortunate reality of life in a fallen and broken and sinful world, right? That the world is full of evil and injustice, and so anger and wrath and rage is just an unfortunate reality of life that it is just part of how you get on in this world, this broken and fallen world that we live in. Right, and part of the complexity, I actually think that talking about anger is maybe the most complex of these seven deadly sins because right, there is some sense that as we are created in the image of God who himself looks upon injustice and violence and evil with a certain anger and even a certain fury, Right? There is this sense that as so long as the world is full of evil and full of injustice, that yeah, people made in the image of God are likely going to feel that in a righteous way. Right? We could say that, you know, I always, you know, I, I tend, well, never mind, I'm going to need to go there now. But I'll, we would say it this way, that apart from anger, like if you don't feel that intensity of that angry emotion in the face of violence and justice and evil, right? you may not be led to take up the cause of injustice, right? Or it's that rage at the world that is not yet made right that leads you to step into the gap and intervene on those on behalf of those who suffer, right? Uh, it's Martin Wendell Jones who said, the presence of anger is always most fundamentally a sign that we care about something. Right, but then the question is, What? You know, and that's the thing, is you, you read through, the, you know, writers throughout the history of the church, they're always saying, yeah, anger is this passionate, intense emotion that demonstrates this care and concern. But the question always is, what is the target of that? Is it genuinely that I am enraged when I see evil and injustice and oppression do its worst against my neighbor or my brother and sister in Christ or my family and out of a compassionate concern for them I am filled with this anger like I tell people all the time when I go to funerals 
The primary emotion that I'm experiencing is usually one of anger. That death is wreaking its havoc. And, and I like to think that that's a righteous anger that has a righteous target. But there's a fine line between that and then this target that is turned inward. Right? And this rage and this anger and this wrath that comes at a result of injustice that I'm enduring. And we allow that to be an excuse to sin towards my family, towards my brothers and sisters in Christ, towards my neighbor, <laughs> because I'm suffering injustice. Uh, and man, you know, what the writers would say is, man, you got to watch out for that. That is where anger becomes deadly. That is where anger both, it feels Right. It, you know, sometimes it feels good. Sometimes it's almost like pleasurable to sit there and to seethe over what you would say to someone if this person, if you had them, right? So it makes you feel alive. It's got your adrenaline going. It's almost like this high, right? But, man, anger has that a power to consume and to utterly destroy. Not just your relationships, uh, but even you yourself. That's Frederick Buechner who, who said this, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. He says, to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you're going to give back. Oh, in many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback, he says, is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton is, at the, is the feast. The skeleton at the feast is you. Right? And so that's what we want to explore today. Right? Again, it's that idea that, man, these things, they're glittering. They feel right and good, but they can become the suppressive destroyers of our souls. And so we want to let James unpack that for us, and then uh, we, we want to hear how, what James his strategy for resisting that. Okay? So, uh, James. Uh, James 3 and 4. You almost get the sense from James that uh, the world that he is inhabiting or the churches that he's in, mingling with, that they're really struggling with conflict. And I should say this. Sorry, one last thing by way of setting this up. So, in, in specifically, the anger we are going after this morning, not that righteous anger. Talk about that another time. In particular, I'm going after this morning this anger that leads us into conflict, right? That anger that destroys relationships and leads us, right, into conflict with one another, whether it's brothers and sisters in the church, whether it's with a spouse or with our children in the home, or whether it's with my neighbor, these people that God has called me to love, right? And again, uh, you almost get the sense that James, like, there's a lot of this going on because James, he's almost suspicious that there even is a thing called righteous human anger, right? He says as much in chapter 1, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So therefore put away all filthiness, all rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness that implanted word which is able to save your souls, right? And so then this morning, uh, Dan read for us a lengthy passage, which we're going to touch on, but I want to zero in first off on, um, well, let me say this. Sorry, I keep backing up. <laughs> this is what happens when I also lead worship on the day I preach, a little scatterbrained. Um, but I think what James wants to do here this morning is he wants to push back on this notion that anger is just a part of life. And he, really he wants to do this. He wants to pull back the curtain and show the full ugliness of it. Uh, Bible Fellowship Church used to own a, um, a Bible conference retreat center up in the Poconos. We still got to have a relationship there, so we drive up there for annual conference and things like that. And I can always remember uh, when coming back, just before you leave Stroudsburg, or just after you leave Stroudsburg and you're coming like through Gap there, there's this billboard that would sit up on the left, and it was always either owned or rented by some anti-smoking campaign. And their whole strategy was to either show you visibly just the, the damage 
that smoking does or show you the ridiculousness of it, right? So they would show, you know, a, face of, a, a picture of somebody's face who was radically distorted by, you know, smoking, or they would show you a picture of a lung that has been just totally rotted out because of this, or they would show, you know, like a cute little bunny smoking a cigarette, right? And just, again, just like... And I feel like James is doing the same thing. <laughs> like, don't let anger be this cute, cuddly little sin that we just sort of accept. Let me pull the curtain back and show you just how wretched this really is, this anger that leads you into conflict. And he does it, first off, here, by asking a question. <laughs> I was driving with one of my daughters yesterday in the car and thought that I noticed a slight incident of fear that was keeping her from something. So like any good father does, we were in the car and she was trapped and couldn't go anywhere because we're going down the blue route, I decided to ask, hey, what was that back there? What's, you know, look like fear to me. Tell me a little bit more about that. And she was trying to dodge it and tell me, no, this isn't fear. It's just I didn't want to do that sort of thing. So I would ask questions. Well, why didn't you want to? I keep asking questions. And thankfully, her patience held out. She didn't get bitter and angry at me for asking so many questions. But I don't know why this comes to mind. But that's sort of how I feel about James asking almost a question here in the beginning that he knows the answer to. Chapter 4, verse 1. What is it? What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? What is it that causes quarrels? What is it that causes fights among you? Okay, and so here's the thing. My guess is that if you ever find yourself in fight mode or conflict mode, somebody has said something that has been deeply wounding, deeply offending, deeply insensitive or whatever, and you're in fight mode, or you're in conflict mode, you have an answer to that question. What is it, brother, sister, that's causing this fight and quarrel? I'll tell you, James, what the issue is. <laughs> this person's being a jerk. Did you hear what they said to me when they were, or, or what they said about me? I had, they didn't know I was there, but I saw it when we were in the gym having coffee. They were talking, and they said something about me that was totally unfair not right, stepped on my pride. So we're in conflict now. And what's causing that fight? The person being a jerk. Right? Or, I don't know, you ask a spouse, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Oh, I'll tell you what causes. My husband is very insensitive. <laughs> he does, has no appreciation for all the things that I do around here. He's never happy, he's never satisfied and he's constantly poking at me, or my wife is constantly nagging at me in the same way. I come home, I just need a moment of rest. My wife is constantly on my throat, nagging. I tell you what causes fights and quarrels. My wife's spouse is never satisfied. It's never enough. Did I, Joe, did you nod at that? No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I need glasses. I think I'm getting to that age. I couldn't tell. But uh, You know, you come home at the end of the day. And it feels like all hell is breaking loose in the house. The little kids are, I don't know, throwing stuff everywhere. They're yelling and screaming at one another. There's toys all over the place. I tell you what causes me to enter that home in a, in a posture of conflict. Not out of loving concern to shepherd and care for my kids, but out of conflict. It's because, it, whatever, they don't respect me. They don't listen to me, whatever. <sighs> James, right. I feel like whenever we get to a new creation, eternity someday. I feel like I'm going to have to go up to James and say, James, let's go grab a beer or let's go grab a coffee and, and sit and talk because I need to apologize to you. There have been times in my life where I have thought very impure thoughts about you, <laughs> largely because of how you answer this question, which I can't seem to get out of my head. And time and time again, it's like the spirit has on loop in my head. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't you know? There it is, James. We know you know the answer. What is it? Don't you know it's this? You desire and you don't have. And so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain. And so you fight and quarrel. Why is it the fights? You have fights and quarrels? It's because you want something. You want something deep inside your heart and you don't have it. Either you can't get it or it's been taken from you. And so you fight and you kill. And everything inside of you rages and says you take your wrath and your fury, and you wield that as a weapon to go get what is rightfully yours and what's been taken from you. 
Case in point, right? If I go to someone else's house and their kids are being crazy and banging off the walls and throwing things and pulling each other's hair and yelling at one another, it doesn't, that doesn't throw me into any sort of anger or rage. If anything, the emotion I'm feeling at that one is joy and delight. And I start to smile and I look at them, oh, it happens here too, this is great. Okay, but they come into my house and George and Jeffrey are just off the wall crazy and I'm tripping over their toys and they're yelling at each other. Well now, I am not moving towards them as the love of a parent. Or that's not my first reaction. Right? Why? Because for me, my home, I want my home to be an oasis of peace. I want my home to be a sanctuary of comfort. So that when I come home, or if it's been a long day, or whatever it is, I can just enjoy some of that peace and comfort. And right now, these kids are taking that from me. And so I am moving towards them, not as a loving father, just to try to shepherd them and to parent them into a wise control of their bodies or whatever. I am moving towards them out of this uncontrolled, unrestrained love of my heart that is saying, your peace and your comfort is in jeopardy here. Go get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or the scenario in the gym, hypothetical. Right? At the end of the day, James is saying, no, 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 brother. L listen, your rage that's coming out of you is not a result of their sin towards you. Your rage is because you have a greater love in your heart. You have this love for respect or for dignity, or this love to be treated fairly, which all good things. Dignity, respect, being treated fairly and justly, that's a good thing, right? But you love that to an ordinate, inordinate level. It is an out-of-control love, such that now you justify any lack of love, any bitterness, any hatred, any rage, any sin towards them because they've taken something from me. Well, we could talk about that all day, but we've got to keep going. James is only scratching the surface. He goes on to say there uh, in verse 4, you adulterous people. Right? So now James is saying that when you move towards someone in conflict and in rage and in and anger, not only is that motivated by whatever you're loving in your heart, but it's spiritual adultery. Thanks, James. I feel a whole lot better now. <laughs> right? How is this spiritual adultery, James? Well, James wants to say this, right? Remember, well, I think this is what's behind this. James is saying, look, just remember that any sinful action towards my brother and sister is always a sinful action towards my creator, right? Always remember that you exist not just in covenantal relationship with your spouse or with your family or your brothers and sisters, but you're in covenant relationship with me too. I have set my love upon you. I have sent my son to purchase your redemption, to restore you in relationship with me. I have sent my spirit to raise you to newness of life. I have poured out my grace upon you. I am present with you day in and day out. I have given you hope. I have given you my promises. I give you grace unending. Okay, and this is a two-sided covenant relationship. I am calling you to a life of love. I'm calling you to love me. Above any other God. I am calling you, and I'm calling you to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm calling you to love your brothers and sisters. To walk with all patience and humility. Being willing to bear with one another in love. Being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. I'm calling you husbands to love your wives the way I have loved the church. And was willing to lay down my life for them. To present them as a pure, radiant, spotless bride. Even when they were sinful and running as far away from me as humanly possible calling you to love that. And he's saying to you, and look, you can do that precisely because I have set my love on you, because, precisely because my son has died for you, my spirit is giving you newness of life. I am promising to be with you always. I am promising to guard, to protect you, to secure your future. I am promising in Romans 8 that nothing, this, nothing, either this side of eternity or the next, could ever separate you from the overflow of my love. So you can do that. Because I've given you all this. You know, it's almost like imagine if you, you know, your spouse comes to you and says, man, I'm, I'm feeling a little neglected. I feel like we haven't spent much time together lately. Can we just, you know, get an hour or two to go for a walk and just kind of connect? 
and you say, yes, that is so needed. I really want to do that. Oh, but here's the thing. I love you, dear, but I've got these other loves. <laughs> I've got these other women who are banging on the door all the time and are calling me to the same thing. And man, I, I got I to gotta go show them love as well too. Uh, I mean, it almost seems foolish, but in a sense like that, that's, that, that's what we're saying to Christ. Christ, I, I do love you. I am thankful for the way you are holding up your end of the covenant. And I love you, but I have these other loves. I have this love for my dignity and my respect. I have this love to be treated fairly. I have this love for peace and quiet. I have this love that my time would be used in the most efficient manner possible. And I hear you calling me to love others. But I'm sorry, I have this other love. And it's, and I'm, I'm going here, I'm going over here. You see it? See why James is saying it's spiritual is ultry, brothers and sisters. You have a greater love. These are all good things. But you've elevated them to a love in your heart that is greater than me. And so you yield yourself, you enslave yourself, and you obey the demands of those loves before you are willing to do that for me. Oh, he's just getting started. <laughs> he was on to say, don't you know that friendship with the world is enemy, enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And your head starts spinning. Okay, James, how is this all being a friend of the world and an enemy with you? Well, this is why I had Dan read back up into, into chapter 3. Look, what, look where he says in verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist... Uh, sorry, let me back it up to verse 14. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about this and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Right? In other words, he's saying, look, this is the whole worldly way of life. Right? That you have these ambitions. You have these things that you want, that you crave, that you want to go after. And the world says what? Don't let anybody get in your way. You take that ambition and you go hard after it. And if anybody gets in your way, if anybody robs you of what is rightfully yours, your ambition, man, then you wield whatever you can to go get it back. And James is saying, yeah, that's the way the world works. That's worldly ambition. But I'm calling you to something different. Man, I'm calling you into this kingdom where first I have laid down everything for you and now I'm calling you to live in love. And I'm calling you not to be ruled by your ambition and not to be ruled by your desires and your cravings and these good things that you yearn for. I'm asking you to be ruled by me, to take my burden, my yoke upon you because it's light and it gives you rest and this is what you were made for. He says it's earthly, it's unspiritual. Oh, and then he calls it demonic. Man, James, <laughs> you're telling me this is uh, coming out from my heart. You're calling me spiritual adulterer. You're saying this is friendship with the world. Now you're saying I'm flirting with demons here, right? But he's dead serious about this. I mean, think about it, right? The whole kingdom of Christ, Christ's whole aim is about the restoration of shalom, right? Christ's whole aim, the reason he laid down his life is so that he may restore broken and ruined relationships, Right? The relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father, the relationship we have with one another, the relationship we enjoy with God's good creation. What is the aim of the enemy? It's to tear all that apart. To tear at that fabric of shalom. Right? It's to have you be a spiritual adulterer in your relationship with the Father. It's to have you be in conflict with one another. It's to have you live always in that radical possessiveness of his creation that we talked about last week. You know, with the love of money and mammon and greed and all that, right? We live in this radical possessiveness that says to whatever I have for the moment, mine, and I own the rights, and I am entitled to it, and we violate rule number one of biblical economics that the world and all the fullness of thereof belongs to the Lord and is on loan to us to steward for his glory, right? The moment I clasp it and say mine, well, I'm entitled to it. And you have no right to step on it, to take it from me and pull it from me, right? Again, it's the aim of the enemy. 
to tear at the relationship with the Father, make you a spiritual adulterer, tear at your relationship with one another, make you in conflict, perpetual conflict, tear at your relationship with his creation such that we grab it and seize it and feel entitled to it. Oh man, and I'll go one step further. Or just remind you of something that I say all the time, you know, when I'm counseling with people or I've said it here and I hope that's something that maybe that you'll have on loop in your own head from my own words, that I do think it is Satan's chief strategy to isolate the individual, to have you torn away from all relationships. Because I genuinely think that right when he, when he has you there, he has you right where he wants you. And you can come back and say, well, I'm around people all the time, I'm around people in my home, I'm around people when I go to work, I'm around people when I come to church. Yeah, but it's super easy to approach those relationships in that consumer mindset and to just see them as props for my selfish ambition. And now I'm just using and consuming them. I'm not actually engaged in genuine covenantal relationship with them. Or or to put it bluntly, you're more isolated than you could possibly realize. You're in a more dangerous place than you could possibly realize. Because yeah, you're around people and it looks like it, but you're just using and consuming them. And really, the enemy has you right where he wants you. Man, we're running out of time, and James isn't even done yet. You got anything else for me, James? Oh, yeah, sure. He says, let me give you one more thing here. Who's wise among you? Nope, nope, that's not it. Uh, do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. The thing is, there's only one lawgiver and one judge. He was able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? We could spend a lot of time talking about what in the world is he saying there. I think it's simply this. You know, what happens when we enter into conflict? Well, there's there's a major act of judging going on there. I am seeing the actions that's occurring. I'm making judgment on their motives, their actions, their life story, whatever it is they're bringing to the, I'm, I'm, I'm making judgment. I, and, and, and usually, I'm making judgment out of a, what should be a universally recognized law, which probably is not the law of God, but it's the law of my own selfish ambition. And I'm becoming a judge, and I'm becoming jury, and I'm becoming the executioner. And, Paul, and, and James is saying, who are you? All right, so at the end of the day, he's saying, look, The fundamental problem here is that you have this highly inordinate view of yourself. Which is why I think he says right before that, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And maybe that leads us into how we wrap this up. Have we we pulled the curtain back far enough? Has James been able to maybe just shake loose a little bit this notion that anger, just a part of life, a fallen world, not that bad. It's not going to do that much harm. No, James says, watch out. This stuff will eat you alive. It flows out of your heart, spiritual adultery. It's friendship with the world. It's flirting with demons. It's this prideful, arrogant elevation of yourself, even to God-like status. Who do you think you are? Okay, so real quick, in the five minutes that we have left, what do I do with that? <laughs> yeah, that's is a whole another year's worth of sermons of how you engage and the resistance against anger in your own heart and life that leads you into conflict. You know, but we can say real quickly what James is after here. And first of which is to humble yourself. Right? You back it up even a bit from, from those. Uh, you go up into verse 6. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, so that he may exalt you. Right. In other words, I think what James is saying is here, hey, let me pull back the curtain, and let me show you what you're participating in. And really, you're going to exalt yourself and say, this is all justified? You see that this is spiritual adultery, it's flirting with demons, it's friendship with the world? Man, weep and mourn. Cultivate some of that Lenten spirit and 
not embrace your weakness, but see it and let it do its work. Let it humble you in the face of conflict so that he may exalt you. Hey, you read that, those couple verses there, man, man Paul, you, you, or James, you're trying to beat me into the ground. No, it's humble yourself so that God himself might come and exalt you. I would say the second thing is, man, cling to the gospel. Did you pick up that verse? No, oh, where am I? Verse 5. Don't you know uh, the purpose of the scripture when it says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? I mean, just think about that for a second. <laughs> he's just got done calling us, labeling us spiritual adulterers, friends with the world, flirtate, flirting with demons, you know, exalting ourselves to God-like status. And, yet in the, and then in the same breath, he comes and says, but don't you know, Christ yearns for you, jealously. He yearns over the spirit and the life that he has given to you, the life that he is inviting you to, the freedom that he is calling you. He aches for this for you. Man, thank goodness Jesus is not like we are, right? That when he is trampled on and when he is spat on and when people are literally driving nails into his hands and hanging him up and twisting crowns of thorns and thrusting spears in his side, he is not yielding in any way to rage or to anger, but he is pleading with the Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Man, it's that Christ who though, man, we trip up all the time and we, yeah, we yield to this wretched anger and this conflict, yet he yearns for you. Yet the same Jesus who stretched wide his arms and hung on the cross for your redemption is the same Jesus who longs and to, to move you more and more into life and freedom. It's this Jesus who has entrusted his spirit with you. It's this Jesus who makes promises to you. I'm going to finish that work that I started in you, right? Which is the susten- which is the substance of freedom, right? That is the stuff that when you grasp that and you realize that, yeah, I don't need to be so concerned about safeguarding and protecting my ambitions because Christ has me. One of my vivid memories as a kid, uh, we were in a park. I was pretty young. And there were these older teenage boys sitting on a picnic table. And there was a ball in the ground in front of them. And I, somehow, my parents were over here. I guess I was wandering around. These kids said to me, hey, hey, kid, can you get that ball for us? I said, yeah, well, okay, sure. I was a good kid. So I walked over, grabbed the ball, and gave it back to him. And as I'm turning to walk away, I see the, the guy throw it back onto the ground. He said, hey, kid, can you go get that ball for me? Okay, yeah, sure. I get the ball and I get it. And the guy tosses over the side. Hey, kid, can you look at that ball for me? You know, at this point, I'm like, I, I, I vaguely remember feeling something here isn't quite right. And then, yeah, did I hear a sympathy? Yeah, thank you. In that moment, the next thing that happens, my dad comes, puts his arm on my shoulder, and turns me around. And he says, come on. And, and I hear him advocate for me. <laughs> he turns to those guys and say. That's real mature. Who do you think you are? Why don't you, uh, you know, mess with someone your own size or something along those lines? I don't know the exact words. And whatever, you see, in that moment, and he just grabbed me, and we started to walk, and he just started talking to me and whatever. And in that moment, whatever sense of not rightness I had, it just, it was gone. Right? And it's in that same way, right, when you press into the love of Christ and you capture that image of the same arms that were stretched wide with nails pierced through, the same arms that come around us. And yeah, when all the world rages against us, it's like he comes, he says, come on, I, I got this. Come with me. I've made promises to you. Let me be the judge. Let me be the advocate. Vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. Come with me. Let me remind you of my love. And man, if you can grasp that, can you see how that can be freeing? He gives more grace. To the humble, he gives more grace. Grace that, as the hymn writer says, is the double cure. Saves from wrath and makes me pure. 
right? It's grace that, oh, I just lost my page. Well, you go back. It's grace that is wisdom from above, that is peaceable, that is kind, that is gentle, that is full of mercy. It's grace, ultimately, at the end of the day, that would conform us more into the image of Christ, to the life of Christ, to the freedom and to the joy of Christ, right? And so we end this thing right where we started it. Yes, these vices are glittering. Yes, anger is fun, and it makes you feel alive when you're playing in your mind, not only the hurt you've received, but the hurt you're going to give. But it'll consume you. Whereas Jesus would fill you. Right? Whereas it's a ploy of the enemy to all, to pull you and to tear you away from the relationships you were made for. Jesus died to restore you in relationship with the Father, in relationship with one another, in relationship with his good creation. Right where the enemy at every turn is looking to conform you into his own image. And he can, man, really use rage to do it. Christ at every turn gives grace to conform you into his image. Don't be fooled. Yielding to anger, rage, fury, even when you're sinned against, is this self-destroying endeavor. It would consume you. It would tear you away. It would make you into the image of the enemy itself. But Christ gives more grace. So come to him. Take his yoke upon you. Let him lead you in peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.